loyalty. What does that mean anymore? In a throwaway world where I use what suits me and leave behind the things that got old, like plastic in a landfill, who are you to me? Have my relationships become a commodity? I'm here for you until it's not convenient, until I have something better to do. Is my word just a sound to sound polite? Is community just a word for socialite? It used to be a lot more than that. What world might we have if we got that back? World changers. That's what God wants his followers to be. God wants to see our world continually being transformed. And that happens through people who live like Jesus, who follow Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ in the worship center, family worship venue online, wherever you are, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are called by God to be a world changer. And here's the dilemma. Here's the problem. We all think that what it takes to change the world is some massive, epic, incredible opportunity of global proportions. And we just don't bump into those most days. So we look and say, well, I can't change the world. I'm just, you know, I'm just me. I'm just in my one little part of this world. But I actually believe that the world is changed more by small things that individuals do regularly than it is by the big massive things. We need the big massive epic shifts, but what we really need is thousands and thousands of people doing little things every day. And so here's, as I think about what it means, you know, what, what will actually change the world? What will change our world? Here's what I believe will do it. One decision, one action, one person. Making one decision, taking one action that impacts one person. You can change the world. My life has been radically transformed, not so much by stuff that happened way out there, but by people who've touched my life, by my parents, who made decisions and took actions and did things that transformed my life by walking through my life with Sherry, where she makes decisions to love me and care for me, and that's world-changing for me. And if all of us are doing those, making those one decisions, taking one action, and then touching one person, it changes the world. So I'm gonna ask you if you're comfortable doing it, will you read this with me, one decision, one action, one person, like you mean it. What does it take to change the world? You ready? Here we go. One decision, one action, one person. One more time, ready? One decision, one action, one person. And this is true in little ways. I'll give you one illustration. A few years back, I started getting irritated and bugged a couple months before Christmas time. Because everywhere I went, every time I would buy something, somebody, they would say, well, would you like to round your check up from you know, $4.99 to $5, from $12.50 to $13.00? Would you round up and give a donation towards this? Another place, well, hey, if you write your name on this balloon, we'll put it on the wall and give us a $3 donation and we'll donate to that. And, and they're ringing the, ringing the Salvation Army bell and you're walking in and you're kind of like, oh, geez, do I kind of walk around? And, it just, and I found myself irritated by all these people going, can we have you know, your 47 cents that rounds up to the next dollar, right? And I found myself getting bugged. And I wanted to say, listen, I give to my church. And, 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 I, and I give to some kids in El Salvador. And I, I'm generous. Leave me alone, you know? Um, which wouldn't be good for a pastor to say, see? Um, <laughs> I know that much. So I just kept my mouth. But I'm just kind of like, do I, do I have to have everyone always asking for another 50 cents for another dollar? And I, and I started getting bugged. And in prayer one day, the Holy Spirit just challenged me to make one decision take one action that could impact one person. Here's what God challenged me to do. Every time someone says, can we round it up? Do you want to put your name on a balloon and post paste it on the wall? Do you want to you know, give $2 towards this or that? God put it in my heart. Just say yes enthusiastically. That was my decision. Always say yes. So I started scaring people at the stores. Because they'd say, uh, well, they, and they were kind of shy because everybody's telling me, would you like to round up? Yes, I would. And they, you know, they kind of <laughs> startle them. I, look, I said, I'd be delighted to. Really? And every time, and, so, and I've done this for a couple of years now, it's kind of become like a fun little thing. I try to like, not startle them, but just go, I'd love to. When I walk by a Salvation Army ringer, instead of doing the, oh, I'll go in the other door, man, do I, do I, you know, and I got to go by him in, the, in and going out too. You know. Now I just walk right up to him and I put something in the thing and I look right at him and I say, thank you for serving. I know some of them are paid, but it's okay to thank people even if they're paid, right? I just look and, say, and so I'm trying to just, I made that one decision. So each time I encounter someone, there's one action. That impacts one person, that person I interact with, and whoever that little bit of money goes towards. But I think that's world changing. If lots and lots and lots of people are doing those, not, I'm not telling you you should do that. 
I'm just saying, you find those, what's, that, what's your decision and your action that impacts one person? And if we do that as a lifestyle, it, it will change the world. I really believe it will. And the book that we're going into, we're starting a, a series now on the book of 2 Timothy. We just had an amazing time for 10 weeks going through the Ten Commandments, but we've run out of commandments. We've run, you've done all ten. So now we're going to look at 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bible, uh, you can open your Bible. If you, have, if you have a phone or a Bible app on your tablet, open to, uh, to the book of 2 Timothy. There's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. We're in 2 Timothy. It's four chapters long, so for the next four weeks, we're going to do one chapter a week. And if you do the weekly reading guide, if you've been doing it, you'll, you'll read the book of Timothy every week, getting ready for Sunday, as well as a couple other chapters from the Bible. But in the book of, in, in the book of 2 Timothy, you have really four themes we're going to look at. Each chapter has a kind of a mega theme we're going to look at. And if you will take this one action, you'll see it begin to change your world, because it, lead, it leads to action, it lead, I mean, one change in, in decisions to action to touching people. So here's the four big themes we're going to be looking at in the next four weeks. Today, unflinching loyalty to become a loyal person, to make decisions to be loyal, to take actions to be loyal, it will impact your marriage, your friends, your workplace, everything about you. Next week, we're gonna talk about relentless truthfulness. What does it mean like to make, I'm gonna be relentlessly truthful, to make that decision, to take action, to impact people. The third week, willing sacrifice. Can I willingly choose to sacrifice? Because that's what it means to follow Jesus. And when we make that decision, it changes our actions, it changes our relationships. And then week four is going to be heavenly confidence. How do I live with bold confidence? Not because of who I am, but because of who he is and who the spirit is in me. And if we can grow, if we can grow in loyalty, truthfulness, sacrifice, and confidence, I believe it'll change our world and it'll change the world if we can live this way. So that's our theme that we're going to walk through in 2 Timothy. Now, to understand 2 Timothy, you have to understand what's happening here. You have a person by the name of Paul writing a letter to a guy named Timothy. Paul, in the ancient world, first century, he hated Christians. He hated the church. He was persecuting the church, and he met Jesus, turned his whole life around. And from that point on, he started pouring his life into different men who were going to be leaders in the church. One of those leaders was Timothy. Timothy. So in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul, and this is probably the last book that Paul wrote, he's at the end of his life, he's in prison. He, he can see the finish line, he can see the gates of glory ahead. He knows he's coming near the end of his life. And he's writing to Timothy, who's a young pastor in a really tough secular city called Ephesus. And Paul is saying, Timothy, I got one more chance to tell you what it means to be a world changer to challenge you to live the way I know God wants you to live. And we get the privilege of looking at this letter written from Paul near the end of his life in jail. Remember, remember Paul's the one in the ancient world when the Romans didn't like what you were doing. One of the punishments they would do is they would give you 40 lashes less one. They would strap you up pub publicly and they would scourge you. They would beat you. They thought if they did it 40 times, they'd kill you. They did it 39 times. Paul preached Jesus. They didn't like it. They did that to him. One, two, three, four, five times. He had 195 scars all over his chest, sides, and back. I mean, he's at the end of his life. He has served Jesus hard. He's in this jail. And he's saying, Timothy, I got a little bit of breath left, a little bit of ink left. I'm going to write you one more letter. So when you read 2 Timothy each, each week, this coming three weeks, hear it from somebody near the end saying, Timothy, I just got to tell you. And we know that Paul's near the end because this won't be on the screen, but just listen to these words. Near the end of the letter, okay, here's what Paul says to Timothy. Paul says, Timothy... I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, that's heaven, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. Paul says, Timothy, I'm near the end. Heaven's just a short step away. But one more time, can I challenge you? And if we'll listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy, I think we'll hear God say to us, this is what it means to be a world changer. You do those small decisions and take small actions to touch one person and you watch the world change around you. With that in mind, we'll look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. 
Our theme today is unflinching loyalty in a throwaway world. We live in a world that throws everything away and God says, stay loyal. We live in a world that quits early and God says, hang in there. So here's how the letter begins. And in our letters, we always put our name at the end of the letter. And now you always get the name, you know, it's, it's always electronics for the names at the beginning. But in the ancient world, when they would write it by hand, they would always put their name first so you wouldn't have to figure out who wrote the letter, right? So here's how it starts. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son. That's his son in the faith. It's not a physical son. He's his son in the faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's Paul. You meet Paul in this. He's a, he's a loyal mentor and spiritual father. Paul, Paul says, Timothy, I'm pouring into your life. I've been pouring into your life. I get one. Paul says, I've been investing in my life and helping you become all Jesus wants you to be. And can I tell you something? If you're a Christian, not only can you do that to somebody, you should be. There should be at least one person that you're pouring. Your, if, you're, if you're 16 or 17 and a young Christian, pour into somebody younger spiritually. Encourage them. Pray for them. Talk to them about the scriptures and what they're learning. Pour into another life. Do you know in my life, you know who my first apostle Paul was in my life? It was a guy named Doug Drainville. I was 16, he was 19. Now listen to this. Doug had been a Christian. He didn't grow up in a Christian home. He'd been a Christian for two years. And he poured into my life and he showed me what Jesus looked like. He did. He loved me. He prayed for me. He taught me about the Bible. He'd been only a Christian for two years. He didn't know the Bible that well, but guess what? He knew it better than I did. So he could help me along. And some of you have been Christians for 5, 10, 15 years, and you're going, well, I'm not really ready to invest in someone else's life. Guess what? If Doug Drainville at 19, after being a Christian two years, was ready, you're probably ready. So here's Paul pouring into this younger leader. We can do that. And then Timothy. He's a loyal student and a spiritual son. He's taking advantage of, he's enjoying and receiving from the Apostle Paul. As Paul writes him letters and when he could, spends time with him and helps him grow in his faith. And you know, we also, we all, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's, you, should be, you should be pouring into someone's life and helping them grow in faith, but you should also have someone, you should be able to name who they are, who's further down the road, who's pouring into your life spiritually. Who's praying and saying, hey, how you doing in your walk with Jesus? Hey, how's it going as you're, as you're in your prayer life? Who's asking you, who's helping you grow? And you know that two of the people who do that for me in my life right now, they didn't offer to do it. I asked them if they would. A guy named Carl Overbeek and a guy named Paul Cedar. They're both retired pastors. And I said to them, would you take time every couple months or so to spend time on the phone with me or on a video conference call and just teach me how to be a better pastor and be a better husband and be a better dad? And I give them questions and then they just pour their wisdom into me. And I need that. You know, I'm, 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 50, I'm 56 years old. I need people pouring into my life spiritually. I've been a pastor for 30 years. I need people pouring into my life so I can be a better pastor and a better Christian. I don't, I don't care if you're 16 or if you're 96. Who's pouring into your life? Because that's what's going on here. It's a real person, Paul, pouring into Timothy's life. And Timothy's like saying, now that Paul pours into my life, I can not make some of the mistakes he made. I can learn from him. I can become wiser because of an older person. I can walk in the footsteps of somebody who's going down a good path. We all need that. Now, here's the dilemma. Here's the problem. The new normal in our world is not about loyalty. It's not about unflinching, fierce loyalty. Our new normal is the easy road of just kind of moving on from things if we're not interested. Here's the world we live in. Built-in obsolescence. I mean, built, if you say, well, I really like this. Guess what? It's going out of style soon. Okay, think about telephones. Take a look here. Here's, your, here's a little history of wireless phones. Um, some of you can look up there and go, oh yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> and you know, with each one of these, you know, they, they all have a new plug that doesn't work in any of the other ones. And even if it's the same company, they change. Does anybody have like a drawer full of cords? You're like, I don't know why I'm keeping these because they're useless. You know, it's built in, you know, we, we don't stay with things. That's the world we live in. And so how do you stay loyal to Jesus and loyal to people when you're just jumping from thing to thing to thing? That's the world we live in. How about this? Low commitment or no commitment? We live in a world of low commitment or no commitment. Do you know that when people used to date, they would often court first. They talked to the parents, could I court your daughter? And then, they, and then they'd sit in the parlor and have a conversation, you know, with the parents there. It's been a long time since that, but you know, it's, you know but, and then eventually they might go out on a date and then eventually they might, you know, hold hands. And after a time they might have a kiss and start building, you know, 
And, and now we live in a hookup culture where people can t- take their phone and go, boop, 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 meet me here, we'll do this. Somebody meets someone, has a physical encounter way beyond a courting encounter, and the next day they don't even remember the person's name. That's, the, that's part of our world. The sense of loyalty and commitment. It's, it's, we, we have to be, when we want to grow loyal, we have to understand we're, the, the flow of culture is going against us, right? We're going to have to be swimming upstream on this one, right? We're in a world that says, I want results and pay off now. I train pastors, Organic Outreach International, we train pastors all over the world. Pastor Walt was just training pastors in a, in a refugee camp in Uganda about a month ago. Training pastors who, once they leave that refugee camp, are going to spread all over their part of the world and bring Jesus. And, and, so, and so we train pastors from there all over the United States. And here's what we find with most pastors when you say, we're going to teach you how to take your local church and change the culture from being just about us and the people in the family and worshiping Jesus to being about us, the family, and reaching out with the gospel. We, we, what we do is we help. We have an organization called Organic Outreach International that helps churches move outward with the gospel. And here's the, pastor, here's the question that all pastors will ask really early on. How long will this take? How long till we see our church change and us reaching our community? And here's what we tell them. This is after 20 years. Sherry and I have been doing work and research on this for two decades. We tell them 18 to 24 months of really hard work. And every pastor does this. Everybody look up here. Every pastor does this. <sighs> I, I want a curriculum that I can learn about in two days and then change my church in a week. And we tell them it doesn't work that way. It's 18 to 24 months of consistent change to change the culture of your church because it took you 20, 40, 50, 100 years to get where you are. It takes a lot to change that. We want instant results in our world. And God says things take time to change. But that we have to recognize our world. We live in a world where people say, if you say to somebody, hey, what team, what, what's your team? What's the team you cheer for? And, and oftentimes the answer is, well, who's winning right now? Who's good? We jump from team to team to team. It used to be people had a team they cheered for for their whole lifetime. I mean, that's my baseball team. That's my football team. And I'm, you know, Keith Kruger, one of our pastors here, he is a Raiders fan. And he has been a Raiders fan for a long time. And I asked him this morning, Keith, are you still a Raiders fan? And he went, yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes it's hard to be loyal, baby. He says, now I got to move to Las Vegas. You know, I guess, you know, so he, you know, he said, he's not moving to Las Vegas. But the, the point is, man, we, people just jump from, whoever, who's hot right now? That's who, I'm, you know, that's who I'm following, right? And even you ask a person this question, what's your church? What's your church? Where do you go to church? Oh, well, you know, I, I go over here, I like the music here, and I like the small groups over here, and I like the sermons over here, and I watch this guy online. Yeah, but where, where do you serve? Where do you love? Where do you connect? Where do you give? Where do you receive? Where's your church? Well, I just grab what I want. It's just like a little church buffet. I just grab what I want, Right? That's the world we live in. And God says this, be unflinchingly loyal in a world that isn't. And we need the power of God to do that. In this first chapter, really what Paul is saying to Timothy is, Timothy, you need to walk in that kind of loyalty. You really do. So 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 4. Let's just continue through the chapter. Paul says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors, ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. There's loyalty. Night and day, constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. All right, this is is the loyalty of a spiritual mentor. If you're a note taker, there's a place to write down some of these things. It It says, you know, the... It says, the call and vision of God is passionate loyalty. And I'll give you five ways that that kind of plays out in this chapter. The loyalty of a spiritual mentor is the first one. Paul says, I I pray for you night and day. I think about you. I care about you. Could you imagine somebody saying to you, listen, you mean so much to me. Every day, night and day, I'm praying for you. Man, what would that do to your heart? Really? But there's that kind of loyalty. Paul says, as I pour into your life spiritually, you're part of my heart. That's why you can't mentor 25 people. You can mentor two or three people. You can pour into them. But, but there's, there's, there's this loyalty of a spiritual mentor, someone pouring in to someone else. So let me ask you a couple questions. And I want you to take a moment, look at these up on the screen, and just reflect for a minute in your own life. Here's the first question. Who invested or is investing in, how you, in you and how you can, and how can you honor this person? I mean, who spiritually helped you grow? Was it parents, grandparents, friends, a pastor? Who helped you grow spiritually? And how can you honor this person? And here's the second question. 
Who are you investing in spiritually? And how can you increase your loyalty to this heavenly call? How do you increase your loyalty? So, so who's investing in you? And how, how do you bless them? And who are you investing in? Just take a minute and think about that. Who is it that has helped you grow spiritually? Who's doing it right now? How do you bless them? How do you thank them? Who is it that you're pouring into? And if there's not anybody, who should you start pouring into? It was wonderful this morning at 8 o'clock. I meet with a team out here in the lobby at 745, and we pray, a part of our staff and our volunteer team. And then I meet over here under the exit sign in the hallway there with all of our musicians and all of our tech people, and we pray in there for the service. And, and Pastor Ben just asked us in the hallway there. He said, I want you to think about who poured into you spiritually. And just if you want to lift up a prayer of thanks for that person. Who was it who mentored you and helped you grow spiritually? And almost every person in this big group of people in that hallway there lifted up a prayer of somebody who poured into their life. We should always have someone we're receiving from, always have somebody we're pouring into because that's the journey of following Jesus. Mentor someone and be mentored by someone. And be loyal to that. Be committed to that over time. And watch what God does through it. The call and vision of God is passionate loyalty. Here's the second thing. The loyalty of a family of faith. That generational faith that means so much. You know, this, this is the idea that, that in your birth family, your family by blood, or, or if you're adopted, the family that God has placed you into through adoption, that you say, in that family system, can I connect the gospel? Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I'm sorry, not chapter two. This is 2 Timothy chapter one, verses, one uh, verses, verse five. And he says this. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, and listen to the family legacy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am persuaded, now lives in you also. Paul says there's this cascading of family faith pouring down, pour, pouring down from, from Lois into Eunice, her daughter, into Timothy, her son. And Timothy, hopefully, then passing on to the next generation. But we live in a day and an age now where you know what a lot of parents and grandparents who are Christians say? Well, I'm not going to impose my faith on my children. I'm not going to push my faith on the next generation. Now, I'm not talking about imposing or forcing. But, boy, you should passionately share and passionately pray and model your faith for the next generation. And some of you are aunts and uncles with your nieces and nephews. Some of you with your brothers and sisters who don't know Jesus. I mean, I grew up in a non-Christian home. I don't have that legacy of family passing it down faith. Sherry grew up with that. I didn't. But you know what I got to see? The five kids in my family, Allison, Gretchen, myself, Kevin in the middle, and then Lisa and Jason, us five kids. I got to watch one by one by one by one by one all the kids in my family become Christians because we poured into each other's lives. And those of us that were Christians, we prayed for the other ones. We loved them, and we tried to show them Jesus. And we had, we had a family legacy of faith. Here, here's, here's the question for you. Who is a member of your family who invested in your spiritual journey of growth? Is there someone in your family that poured into your life and thanked Jesus for them? But then here's the next question. What family member can you invest in or are you investing in and how can you increase your loyalty to this honorable heavenly calling of passing on faith through your family? Just take a minute and just quiet your heart. Who's someone in your family that God might use you to pour into spiritually? Take a minute and think about that. Lord Jesus, the gift of family is so powerful. And I pray that every family represented at Shoreline Church will become a household of faith. Even if there's only one person in the family who's a Christian, let their light shine. And maybe it's, maybe it's that we share faith with our parents and we go generationally backwards, generationally, but spiritually, they haven't come to know you yet. But we pray for a powerful work in our homes and our families as Jesus touches each heart and life. We pray this for his glory. Amen. Number three, loyalty to the mission of Jesus. The apostle Paul is saying, Timothy, stay loyal. Yes to your, yes to your family. Yes to, to that mentoring process. But he says, stay loyal to the mission of Jesus. Look with me at verse six of 2 Timothy chapter one. Paul says, for this reason, 
I remind, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He says, Timothy, sometimes the gifts that God gives you to use, they, they burn hot, but sometimes they cool off. He says, your gifts are kind of cooling off, so fan it to flame and get that flame going again, right? For the Spirit of God does not, give, does not uh, make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. I love that. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Paul says, Timothy, stay loyal to sharing the good news of Jesus. And I think that's for all of us. If you're a Christian, God says, be loyal to sharing this amazing good news that has changed your life. That there is a God who loves you. Even though we've sinned and messed up, God loves you. He came among us. Jesus Christ came. He died for us on the cross and took our sins and he rose again in glory. We have a story to tell the world. And Paul says, Timothy, stay loyal. So here's the questions for you to reflect on. What gift do you need to fan into heavenly flame? What gift has God given you? What ability? Maybe leadership, maybe teaching, maybe, maybe you have a beautiful voice to, to sing, an instrumental ability. Maybe you're good with administration or organization. Maybe you're great working with kids. What's your gift that's kind of cooled off? And God says, fan it to flame. Serve Jesus with your gifts. And then who needs to hear about the amazing love, presence, power, and goodness of Jesus? And how can you share your story? Share the story of how Jesus has changed and is changing your life. Be loyal to that story and to using the gifts that God has given you. Number four, the call and vision of God, passionate loyalty. Here's how we live it out. Loyalty to count the cost and even suffer as you follow Jesus. Even willingly suffer. Remember, Paul's in prison as he writes this. And he says in verse 11 of 2 Timothy 1, and of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That sounds like great. Isn't that exciting? Look at the next verse. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul says, I may be in prison and my life may be coming to an end, but I know who I've believed in. And he says, I follow Jesus. Now listen, you gotta hear this. He says, I follow Jesus, and because of that, I've gone through a lot of suffering. See, sometimes we think when we have pain and suffering, the first question you should ask is, what did I do wrong? And sometimes we have pain and suffering because we do, we make bad choices, no question. But Paul is saying, sometimes times are hard because you're doing what's right. And Paul is saying, Timothy, he says, Timothy, and, and, he, and he, Paul realizes he's maybe the, probably the last letter he's going to write and the last letter is certainly to Timothy. And he says, young pastor in this tough town. And Paul says, Timothy, will you keep doing what God's called you to do even when it hurts? Will you keep following Jesus even when there's pain? Will you be faithful and loyal to Jesus even when it's hard? Because can I tell you something, Shoreline Church? If you will only follow Jesus when things are easy, there's going to be a lot of times you're not going to follow Jesus. But he is worthy of your loyalty even when things are hard. And Paul looks and says, I ended up in jail again because I preached Jesus and did the right things. Five times they lashed him up and gave him the 40 lashes minus one. Five times. 195 scars on his body. And he said, I'm going to keep preaching Jesus. And Paul says, Timothy, you got to know something, Timothy. And all of us in some way are that Timothy, hearing from Paul right now. If you're a Christian, there's going to be times where you follow Jesus hard and faithfully and, and you stay loyal and it's still hard. Will you keep following him? Because it's that kind of loyalty that changes the world. And I don't know a single pastor that if they say, well, I'm going to quit ministry when it gets hard. I don't know a single pastor that will still be in ministry. Not one. You don't serve Jesus because it's easy. You serve Jesus because he's Jesus. Amen? Amen? 
You serve him because he loves you and he served you and he gave himself for you. So here's the question. How can I count the cost and even suffer for the sake of following Jesus? It may cost you time. It may cost you resources. It may cost you your reputation with some people. Will you follow Jesus, whatever the cost? Because he invites us to. And then five, the call and vision of God, passionate loyalty, what's it look like? Loyalty to the person and to the gospel of Jesus, and particularly to understanding that that the, the, the word of Jesus is something we have to hold to in our world. So we read this in verse chapter, chapter one of 2 Timothy, verse 13. It says, what you heard from me Keep us the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit, guard the truth of God's word. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Paul says, Timothy, will you hold to Jesus and will you hold to his truth? Will you keep his word in your heart? Will you keep his word in your mind? Will you hold on to his truth and his word, whatever the cost? We recently, Sherry and I had a friend in our home, he's a producer, and he produced a movie called, <clears throat> called Tortured for Christ. It's a really tough movie that looks at a really tough situation of, of Richard Wormbrand, who actually was doing evangelism, and he knew if he got caught, he would be imprisoned. He, and he knew he was going to get caught, and he got caught, and they imprisoned him. And he also knew that when he was imprisoned, they would not let him have a Bible. So he memorized huge parts of the Bible because he knew he was going to be locked up. So he carried the word in his heart. I wonder if I got locked up tomorrow and somebody wouldn't let me have a Bible, how much of God's word do I have in my heart and in my mind? We hold to this book because it's true and it's so convenient. We have so many Bibles around. Just pick up your phone, click, click. Got the Bible right there in 57 versions, right? But in our hearts, and in our minds. And so we're invited to be loyal to knowing the word of God so we can share it with others. So here's a question. What can you do to increase your knowledge of the scriptures and your loyalty to God's truth? Do you know the word of God? Do you read it faithfully? I want to challenge you every single day. Pick up this book or on your phone, have a tab set and open up to a Bible program. Go to the Shoreline app and pick day one of the week for tomorrow and you can click on it. We've got a, a, it'll open the Bible passage right there for you. And it'll actually, it'll actually be, second, it'll be Second Timothy chapter one, Monday, and next day it'll be Second Timothy chapter two. And if you click on that, you can read it or you can listen to it. But get God's heart and get God's word in your heart and in your mind. Let it change your life. Increase your knowledge of the scriptures. Come to it, you know, sign up for a Bible class. Jump into a Wednesday night program where we're learning God's word together. Get into a Bible study. Here's the reality. Loyalty is a daily choice. Loyalty is a daily choice. So don't flinch. Don't, uh, I don't know if I want to be loyal. When I, when, I was a, when I was a young guy, I don't know if girls did this, but my, me and my friends did this. We'd stand like this, and, and our friends would act like they're going to punch us in the face and say, made you flinch, made you flinch. Did anybody else do that? It was just me and my friends anyways. Okay, thank you. Bob over here, at least one other guy is crazy, right? Okay, but <laughs> it would be like, you try to stand there, and, and you had to keep your eyes open, you know? And the world's going, the world, when it comes to being loyal, the, Lord's, the world's going, made you flinch, made you flinch, made you flinch, made you flinch. And we should say, no, you didn't. I stand in loyalty for God. And the apostle Paul, he's at the end of his life. He's, he's in jail. He sees, he sees the gateway to heaven. He knows he's gonna be in heaven soon, but he's still suffering. He's, he actually says, bring me my cloak. He says, I'm cold, I'm cold. It's cold in this dungeon that I'm in. And, 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 and yet in this, he says, and there's some people who have been loyal to me. And there's some people who have taken off and left me in the lurch. Listen to how, listen to how the chapter ends. It's very personal. Paul says, you know, you can, hear, you can hear his heart. He says, I've been serving Jesus. I'm locked up in jail. And he says, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. But then he says, but there's someone who stuck with me. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus because he often refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Here's the last question. Will I run or refresh? Will I be the person, when, it, when I'm called to be loyal, 
in a friendship, in a marriage, in a workplace, in a church, to Jesus? Am I going to be the one when things are tough that takes off and runs? Or am I going to say, I'm going to stay right here and God's going to use me to refresh your soul. God's going to use me to encourage you and build you up. Unflinchingly loyal to Jesus and when he's in us, to the people around us. And I believe if we all live that way, it will change the world. And that's what God wants. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer, that you will fill us in a fresh way with your Holy Spirit. For all of us who have come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, will you give us the strength to be so loyal to you, to your word, to your gospel, to the people you've called us to pour into, to our families, to our church. Lord, make us loyal people that we would make those decisions and take those actions that impact one person and through that sees their world and our world change. Oh, Jesus, thank you for the greatness of your love. You are loyal to us. You left the glory of heaven and laid your life down on a cross when we didn't deserve it. Teach us loyalty in all that we do and through us, transform this world for the glory of Jesus. And everyone said, receive God's blessing as you go from here. You walk out into a world that in many ways is forgetting what loyalty looks like. In the name of Jesus, show the world. Show the world what it looks like to be loyal to a family and loyal to your friends, loyal to your church. Even loyal to the Raiders? I don't know. (laughs) But the things that matter, show the world what loyalty looks like and through your life, be a world changer. Amen? Amen? God bless you. We'll see you next week.